Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, HS2 and Geopura, building a net zero future together. I'm Mark, Carbon Manager at High Speed 2, and today I'm going to be your host. We're really proud to be supporting Net Zero Week, the UK's National Awareness Week, which provides a dedicated platform to voice opinions, share advice and information to help us all make changes to transition to a net zero carbon future. The carbon emissions challenge that we face has never been clearer. The UK's pledge to bring greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 is rightly considered amongst the most pressing social and economic issues. However, as it stands, the construction sector is responsible for 39% of global carbon emissions produced by the manufacturing of building materials and burning of fuels. As Europe's largest construction project, we're taking action to decarbonise construction, setting new industry leading standards and building the world's most sustainable high speed railway, High Speed 2, for zero carbon travel across Britain. This means achieving net zero carbon emissions as an organisation by 2035, a full 15 years ahead of schedule set by government. But before I give away too much of what's to come, let's move on to quickly run through some housekeeping and what we've got in store for you all today. So we don't anticipate any technical issues during our event, but should you experience any connection issues, for instance, if your feed freezes, wait for about 10 seconds and it will mo most likely correct itself. If that doesn't happen, use the leave button to exit the event and rejoin using the event link. This slide just shows some of the features of Microsoft Teams in case you're not familiar with it. Along the bottom are the play and pause, volume and full screen controls. All attendee microphones are muted. However, you can still participate through submissions of questions via the question panel on the right hand side of your screen. If at any point during the conversation you want to ask a question, you can click ask a question button, type in your question and hit send. This will come straight through to me. I'll be keeping an eye on the questions that come through as we go. And then at the end of the session today, we'll answer as many of them as, that we, as we have time to get through. Finally, your feedback on today's event is greatly appreciated. So after the session, we'll send around a short feedback form. It'll only take a few minutes to complete. We want to learn more about what you think as it's important in helping us improve and develop our engagement. Also, I do want to outline that we want to have a really friendly, informative event today. We really want to get lots of questions and have a really good discussion. But in all our interactions, we do ask that people are respectful towards our staff and speakers. If you do have any specific issues where perhaps our works are affecting you and you need a direct conversation, please do get in touch with us via our help desk, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days per week, and we'll be absolutely happy to help wherever we can. If you want to find out more about our statement on conducting respectful conversations, the statement is available on our website. Now onto what we have in store for you today. So we'll kick off by explaining what HS2 is and how HS2 will help us to reach net zero. Then I'll take you through our carbon targets and how we're already making progress to pioneer a cleaner, greener way to build and run high speed railways. Then I'll hand you over to Matt and Ian from our supply chain company Geopura, who will take you through their exciting innovations in hydrogen that are helping us and the wider industry to decarbonise construction. Then finally, we'll open up the floor to put your questions to our panel in a Q&A session. So what is HS2? HS2 is Britain's new zero carbon high speed railway being built now. HS2 trains will link four of the UK's five largest economic regions, the Scottish Central Belt, the North West, West Midlands and South East. HS2 will integrate with new lines and upgrades across Britain's rail system to deliver faster travel to many towns and cities across Britain, not directly on the HS2 route, including Liverpool, Sheffield, Nottingham and Derby. The government is planning over 260 miles of new high speed line across the country with HS2 building 230 miles. 140 miles of new high speed line is already under construction between Birmingham and London. We're building HS2 to the highest standards using world class engineering to protect the countryside, protect local communities and cut carbon. It is a huge undertaking. It's Britain's first new intercity railway north of London in 100 years and Europe's largest construction project. And to achieve the same level of economic and environmental benefits seen from high speed rail in mainland Europe and Asia, Britain needs a nationwide high speed rail network. HS2 will be exactly this, Britain's high speed rail network, helping to address three key problems facing the nation. Capacity, carbon and connectivity. 
So in terms of capacity, UK rail demand has more than doubled in the last 20 years and is forecast to keep growing with significant pressure on key north-south routes. Further upgrades to the current lines would cause significant disruption for passengers and line-side communities and would deliver a fraction of the capacity as a new railway line. So building HS2 unlocks a massive amount of space on the existing network by placing high-speed passenger services on their own pair of tracks. HS2 adds hundreds of thousands of seats onto the network each day and by taking long distance services off the existing rail network, frees up space for more freight services as well as local and regional passenger trains. So also about connectivity, so HS2 has the potential to change the economic geography of the country and be a catalyst for growth. By bringing Britain closer together, there can be more investment in the Midlands and the North, opening up leisure and job opportunities for millions of people. And it's also about carbon. So transport is the UK's largest emitter of carbon. For the UK to tackle climate change while supporting a growing economy and population, it needs more zero carbon forms of transport, which HS2 will deliver from 2029. HS2 will offer zero travel as a clean alternative to long distance car journeys and flights, helping the UK to tackle climate change and improve air quality. Carbon reduction isn't a new requirement for HS2. It's fundamental to our purpose. HST will be a critical part of a net zero carbon transport system. It will deliver zero carbon journeys to hundreds of thousands of people every day and will contribute to the decarbonisation of the wider transport sector through modal shift of passenger and freight journeys from road and air to rail. But the benefits of HST are not just delivered through what we build, but also through how we build. So where are we now? So to start a little bit about the construction project. So HS2 Limited was set up by the Department for Transport with a mandate to develop and promote the UK's new high speed rail network. Over the past decade, we've been designing the railway, consulting and seeking the powers through Parliament to begin construction. Current plans are for phase one to begin operation between Birmingham, Curzon Street and Old Oak Common in West London between 2029 and 2033, and for the full network to be complete by 2041. Since receiving notice to proceed from government back in April 2020, we've made significant progress across our main work civils, and there are now over 350 active sites along the phase one route between the West Midlands and London. As you can see on the screen, the South Portal site next to the M25 in Hertfordshire is one of the largest of these. There are two tunnel borrow machines, Florence and Cecilia, now deep underneath the Chiltern Hills. But we are building more than just the railway. So our seven strategic goals inform our daily work and long term planning as we design and build the new high speed rail network. They highlight the benefits HS2 will bring to people and places throughout the UK. So rebalancing the economy, boosting rail capacity and connections, providing new jobs and combating climate change. Carbon reduction is one of our strategic objectives. All of our suppliers are and will be signed up to helping us deliver on these goals and we'll hold them to account for what they deliver and the way they behave. To reduce carbon emissions, we need to first understand the whole life carbon impact of the programme so that we can identify carbon hotspots. So those being the areas with greatest impact and potential for carbon reduction. On the screen, this is what the carbon footprint of phase one of HS2 would look like if we were to simply adopt current UK construction industry practice. It's measured over the whole life of our assets, so that includes the construction period and 120 years of operation. The whole life carbon footprint would be approximately 14.5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. And you can see that almost half of those are associated with the extraction, processing and manufacture of raw materials and construction products. A further 25% of the carbon footprint is then associated with the transport of those materials and products to construction sites and the subsequent construction and installation processes. So about three quarters the carbon emissions are associated with the construction phase, the remainder being associated with maintenance and replacement activities, and the energy consumed to operate our trains, stations, depots and infrastructures. So what are we doing to reduce carbon emissions? Well, here I'd like to talk through three tangible examples of where and how we're reducing emissions as we design and build HS2. So Align Joint Venture, they're delivering Colm Value Viaduct, and there they're on track to cut the amount of embedded carbon by 28%. So that equates to roughly 63,000 tonnes of carbon emissions. 
They've achieved that by working closely with our rail systems colleagues to narrow the structure by over a meter. That's enabled significant reductions in the amount of concrete and steel that's needed and a reduction in the carbon emissions. They've also significantly reduced the amount of earthworks required for the approach embankment. So that's reducing carbon emissions from the transport of materials to site. Also helps to reduce disruption for local residents by reducing the number of HGVs on local roads. Thames Valley, Valley Viaduct, that's been delivered by EKFB. That's a great example of how our contractors are using the latest engineering techniques to reduce carbon emissions from construction. So the design team has simplified the structure of the viaduct so that every major element can be made off-site before being assembled on-site. So it's slotted together like a giant Lego set and they're cutting the carbon footprint by an estimated 33%. Again, as well as cutting embedded carbon in terms of the materials, the approach also requires less lorries to deliver material to sites, it cuts waste and it will reduce disruption for the community during construction. And then at Curzon Street Station, the new station in Birmingham city centre, that's set to achieve a 55% reduction in whole life carbon emissions. The station's designed to achieve zero carbon emissions from energy consumed to operate building integrated systems like heating, cooling and lighting through reducing energy demand and consumption, for example, by using LED lighting, but also generating low carbon energy through nearly 3000 square meters of solar panels on the platform canopies and ground source heat pumps. We're using prefabricated timber soffit units. They're 27 times more carbon efficient than steel comparators. So they'll be installed in the main station roof. The paving in the public realm has been reduced in depth by 33, 38% to reduce embodied carbon. And we're using 100% recycled content steel roof sections. They'll be bolted together rather than welded, which enables future reuse and recycling. So we are delivering carbon reduction already across the programme, but we want and need to go further. So that's why at the start of last year, we launched our net zero carbon plan. The plan explains the work that we've undertaken to date, what we're doing now, but also maps the progress that we'll make in the years ahead on our journey to achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2035. So the plan sets some key actions, including becoming a net zero carbon business by 2025, delivering zero carbon travel from day one of operation, and achieving net zero carbon construction and operation from 2035. And what we mean by that is that we'll reduce emissions as far as possible. And from 2035, we'll offset residual carbon emissions that we can't eliminate as we build, maintain and operate HS2. So we plan to work towards net zero by, for example, eliminating diesel on all of our construction sites by 2029 specifying and purchasing concrete and steel with half the production carbon emissions of 21 levels by 2030 and using 100 zero carbon electricity to power our trains stations depots and infrastructure the plan also looks then at ways that we will influence the wider construction and manufacturing industries to create a cleaner greener future so to support these targets we've identified 10 key action areas that will be critical in, in delivering our ambition the action areas are really diverse in nature and include, for example, building a consistent net zero carbon culture, raising awareness, motivating action and building capability to drive carbon reduction, communicating our net zero carbon objectives to stakeholders and being clear about how we can work together, using digital engineering tools and processes to transform and improve project delivery to reduce carbon emissions, investing in innovation and forming partnerships to speed up ways to cut emissions in our supply chain. But we're also working with industry groups and peers, supply chain partners and key, and key stakeholders to ensure that our efforts are aligned, that they're effective and that they inspire action. And sharing best practice and lessons learned with the wider construction sector. So using our influence to encourage others to take action to tackle climate change. So there is a lot to do to get to net zero, but our work to cut carbon emissions is well underway. And this is particularly true in our activities to eliminate diesel from our construction sites. So in the last 18 months, we've made a huge amount of progress in accelerating our diesel free ambition. With the pressures from the removal of the entitlement to use red diesel in construction, there's been a big push across the industry to develop alternatives and find efficiencies. And we have and continue to collaborate with our arms length bodies to align plans to decarbonise construction, sharing lessons learned and opportunities. Developed 
zero diesel sites route map with the with construct zero which was launched at the beginning of june setting out the industry's approach to eliminating diesel we continue to motivate supply chain partners to reduce diesel use and implement means to accelerate new technologies we've developed use case examples demonstrating cost and environmental benefits through various innovation trials and alter alternative solutions We've developed an anti-idling toolkit for use across the industry with the Supply Chain Sustainability School and partnering contractors. And we aim to accelerate adoption of energy efficiency solutions. And in May 2022, we announced our first diesel-free construction site at Canterbury Road Ventilation Shaft in South Kilburn in London by our joint venture SES, made up of Skanska, Coste and Strabag. So the ventilation shafts, they'll be linked to the Houston tunnels to regulate air quality and temperature in the tunnel and provide access for emergency services. The site sits within a constrained boundaries with residential areas and a school in close proximity and really highlighted and raised the need for teams to do something differently. The site teams were proactive in identifying alternative solutions, which a site as a combination of. So the site prioritized a mains power electricity connection on a 100% renewable energy tariff. They have one of the 160 tonne fully electric Corolla trains. They're using biofuels, hydrogenated vegetable oil, where there is no other option um, and, the, and the cleanest engine technology available. So now we have 19 confirmed diesel free sites with a number of others making steady progress, all using a range of different technologies um, electric, hydrogen, solar, gas, biofuels. And it's support from companies like Geopura that is helping us to accelerate our ambition. So I'll now hand over to Geopura team to detail out their technology and how this is supporting HS2 sites. Thank you very much, Mark, and uh, we appreciate that introduction. And uh, my colleague Ian Wilkinson and I are delighted to spend a few moments with you now and explain a little bit about our work at Geopura. So Geopura was established back in 2019, following more than a decade of R&D investment focused on zero emission fuels and zero emission fuel technologies. Our interest has been on what we can do now in the real world to really begin to turn the dial on climate change. With this in mind, we have worked to bring credibility, scalability, and most importantly, solutions that are commercially viable. And working in close collaboration with Siemens Energy, Geopura is the result of that. And if you look on the screen, you can see the diagram on the right hand side. In essence, simplistically, what we're doing at Geopura is we're using renewable sources of electricity, solar PV, wind, anaerobic digestion through water electrolysis to make hydrogen. And then we're storing and transporting that hydrogen to be used again to be turned into electricity um, at construction sites, at events and festivals and other locations for a variety of customers. And we're delighted to have just completed an initial investment round where we've welcomed Siemens Energy, General Motors, Swen Capital and Barclays Green Capital Fund as shareholders. And this funding is enabling us to scale and do even more with our existing and new customers, the likes of which include the BBC, Netflix, Bell for BT and the National Grid. Now, Geopura are committed to decarbonisation but as an early adopter of zero emission technologies, we've had to fill in all the supply chain gaps to deliver the reliability needed to build trust with our customers. And as you can see in the diagram here, we're working at all levels of the supply chain to achieve just that. So on the left hand side of the diagram, we are producing uh, reliable quantities of green hydrogen through our electrolyzer plants. We're then transporting and managing and storing the logistics of that hydrogen and getting it to the sites and locations where we have hydrogen power units on sites at construction sites and other sites around the country. We're then using that fuel for a variety of different customers in a different variety of locations. And I have to say, if you look at the supply element of the box, you can also see hydrogen dispenser, because of course, once you've got hydrogen on site to supply a hydrogen power unit, that same hydrogen can be used to power other equipment, other plant, maybe JCBs and such like, uh, and other uses at construction sites. So I've already mentioned, we work with the BBC and Netflix and National Grid, but other customers include the Goodwood Festival of Speed, and Polestar, and uh, even the National Grid where we've supplied site power for the UK side construction of the North Subsea Viking Link Grid Interconnector. 
At this point, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague Ian Wilkinson, who's COO at GeoPura. Many thanks, Matt. Um, so the centerpiece of the GeoPura offering is our hydrogen power unit, and that's what we're showing in the photographs here, um, also known as an HPU. And that unit takes hydrogen as a fuel, runs that through a fuel cell to generate electricity, which we then run through some inverters and output 400 volt three phase AC, as is quite common um, from other sources of, uh, of electrical power, three phase electrical power, uh, for then use on our customer sites. In this case, it's a construction site. But the HPU is the heart of the, of the unit. Um, you feed it hydrogen and it generates electricity. And we work very hard to make sure that the, um, uh, the, the units are reliable and fully fueled and ready uh, for, for use at our customer sites as they need. Uh, the advantage of using hydrogen in, in this instance through a hydrogen fuel cell is that it's very clean, very clean indeed. Uh, because we're using hydrogen, there's no carbon involved at all. So that means there's no CO2, there's no unburnt hydrocarbons, um, there's no carbon monoxide or particulate matter. Uh, and because it's a fuel cell, it's an electrochemical process, um, there's no, uh, no combustion, no burning going along, so there's no NOx either. Um, we also find that our units are considerably quieter than an equivalently sized diesel generator. So from an emissions point of view, they're very clean indeed. And the photo on the left there of the glass of water is uh, that's in fact the exhaust. So it's pure hydrogen going into the fuel cell, generating the electricity and then very clean water that comes out. And, and that effectively is our exhaust. The HPUs are designed to run unattended as you might probably expect. So we uh, we turn up at our customer sites and deploy the HPUs, uh, put them down with their fuel supply, uh, turn them on and then we're able to operate them remotely. So we can monitor and control the HPUs, keep track of uh, their performance uh, and indeed the, um, you know, the power that's being generated and the fuel levels um, remotely at a remote operation centre uh, so that we can come in and refuel them as desired and, um, and deliver that reliable power um, essentially as a service so our customers just get the power they need and they know that their energy is being generated from hydrogen um, without all the uh, the carbon emissions associated with alternative energy sources. So just expanding on that energy as a service point, as I said, the HPU is the heart of the system. It generates the uh, the electricity on the customer sites. And then as Matt was explaining a few moments ago, uh, we work very hard to fill in the upstream supply chain that delivers the fuel we need to generate the electricity on the customer sites. And what you're looking at in these photographs on the right hand one is an electrolyzer site that we have um, operating. So we use um, water electrolysis, so we're splitting water back into um, oxygen and hydrogen. So the electrolyzer, you feed it water and electricity and it splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen. We keep the hydrogen, compress it into cylinder packs like those shown in the photographs um, and also into tube trailers, which is the photograph on the left. So in that white 20 foot container um, are cylinders where, where we compress hydrogen gas uh, and we can then use that uh, tube trailer to deliver the, the hydrogen fuel that the HPUs need uh, to our customer site. So the, the part of the Geopura um, operation is to generate low carbon hydrogen um, using electrolysis and then we compress it into the cylinders and the tube trailers of the kind you can see in the photos. Those are then delivered to our customer sites and provide the fuel for the hydrogen power unit, which then turns that hydrogen into electricity for our customers to use for whichever purpose they need. And say in this case, it's, uh, it's construction sites. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. So um, the example in the, the, um, uh, that we're bringing here uh, this afternoon um, is our work where we've really appreciated working closely with our customers SGS Rail and HS2. So this is at the Victoria Road crossover and in a city uh, central London site. Uh, where um, we actually deployed two HPUs working as a critical pair, powering the bentonite farm and desanding plant to support critical diaphragm wall construction work. And the result, 
were running geopure hydrogen power units for 400 hours, eliminated around 51 tonnes of carbon compared to using standard diesel generators. And as well as this, significant quantities of NOx and particulates are mit mitigated. We've all been on construction sites where a badly placed generator has churned out its fumes and uh, we've all had the joy of breathing them in. And this was particularly brought home to me uh, at a site where we were working actually with Cadent Gas, also in inner city London, alongside a primary school, where if it weren't for the fact that hydrogen power units deplo were deployed, diesel generators would have been there for many months right alongside the playground. And for the Victoria Road project, well, we were delighted to win Best Use of Technology at this year's Construction News Awards. Our emission-free power is derived from a hydrogen fuel cell with power capabilities ranging from as low as a few kilowatts, utilizing a single HPU, all the way up to two megawatts. And it's worth pointing out that the system also can integrate with the grid so any site power that's available from the grid can be used first and cost effectively integrated with our hydrogen power units to su supplement and supply the power needed for whatever is needed at your construction site. At Victoria Road, we relied on around, on around one delivery of hydrogen delivered via troop trailer per week, which limited, limited the logistics impact around what is an extremely busy inner city site. Another advantage in inner city locations is that HPUs are extremely quiet, enabling 24 hour operations and getting around potentially tight noise construction planning conditions. HPUs can also be coupled to combine heat and power systems to provide heating for site cabins, which further improves efficiency. Working at other construction sites with the likes of Uniper, Belfer Beatty and the MOD, we almost always supply EV charging points as well, alongside the other site power requirements. The HS2 Victoria crossover trial demonstrated the credible use of zero emission hydrogen, producing the required energy to reliably power scale equipment. And now follows a short video detailing more about the Victoria crossover project. I'm Andrea and I'm the HS2 Air Quality Manager. Today I'm on one of our construction sites where we are powered by cleaner, greener energy. Today I want to take you on a tour to show you what that means in reality. Come let's have a look. We've arrived at our hydrogen fuel cell generators directly replacing diesel for the use of hydrogen. Let's go chat to Georgia and find out a little bit more. So we deployed these hydrogen units to help decarbonise our operations. These hydrogen units will power our desanding plant and our bentonite farm to support the construction of the crossover box. Let's go inside and visit our engineer and take a look around. Hi Andrea, welcome inside our green hydrogen generator. Now this generator has got five key components. We've got the fuel cell in the back. That's where hydrogen from the cylinders you saw outside are mixed with oxygen from the air to react to form electricity. The electricity is then fed from the fuel cell into these inverters. Electricity is then fed into these transformers. They step up the voltage and then behind you is all of our control systems. What this means is clean, zero carbon, zero emission electricity to power our construction sites. And the only byproduct is clean, drinkable water. You like to try some? Absolutely. Follow me. Tastes delicious. Thank you, Matt. Um, and just to round off this section of the uh, at the presentation, um, we'd just like to say that we're delighted to be working with HS2 uh, and providing power using our hydrogen power units and the hydrogen supply chain uh, beyond it. And, and we're looking forward to continue to work with them uh, on other sites. We're just about to deploy two further HPUs uh, to the Oxford Road Overbridge site near Aylesbury. Um, and indeed, are looking forward to working with them beyond that and, um, and uh, other construction sites across the country. Um, so all that leaves me to say really is I'll hand back in a moment to Mark Fenton 
Um, but just to say uh, thank you for watching, and we're very happy to uh, to take questions in the Q and A se uh, session that will follow. Back to you, Mark. Thanks, Ian. Now, if you're not one of the 3,000 companies like Geopura who are already working on the project and you're interested in the contract opportunities on HS2, you can register with Compete4, who our contractors use to publish any supply chain opportunities as they arrive. We estimate there are about 400,000 contract opportunities on phase one alone, and we've already contracted £23 billion pounds into the supply chain. Interestingly, 97% of our supply chain is made up of companies registered here in the UK and 61% are SMEs. So signing up to Compete4 and uploading your profile is completely free. It will allow you to see what subcontracts our contractors are looking for. And we'll put a link to Compete4 in the chat and display the QR, on, QR code on the next slide. So you can simply scan with your phone to visit the site. And if you're interested in finding out about the other more informal opportunities for local businesses, such as providing catering or accommodation services for our 30,000 strong workforce, you can put your business on the map on our local business webpage shown here. Finally, if you want to keep up to date with where our works are on our interactive map or to get access to free resources shared by our supply chain, you can visit the other two websites listed here on the right hand side of the slide. And as mentioned, here's the QR code and website link for our Compete4 website if you want to browse and register your interest in HS2 supply chain opportunities. But now to the part where we give you the opportunity to ask us questions in a Q&A session. But before we do, here's just a quick reminder about how to post questions. On the right hand side of your screen, you should see a box and this is the area where you can post your questions and you should see any published responses. So to get started, I'd like to welcome back Ian and Matt to the panel, and we'll start with the first question. So Ian, in simple terms, how does hydrogen fuel cell generation work? Sure, thanks Mark. Um, yeah, great question, and it's fundamental to what we're trying to do here um, with GPO and HS2. So fundamentally what we're doing is taking hydrogen as a fuel so this is a chemical energy carrier um, that, that carries the energy want, we want and we want to um, convert that into electricity. And we're quite um, quite familiar with the idea of turning a fuel into electricity. Normally we do it by combustion and you have an engine that then drives a generator and the generator um, does the electricity. The HPU works in a different way. It uses a fuel cell. That's an electrochemical process where you have a membrane and the, the hydrogen combines with the oxygen through the membrane and that electrochemical reaction generates the potential difference, i.e. generates the electricity that we need. So there's no combustion going on. It's a low temperature process. The fuel cell runs at about 60, 70 degrees C, um, but it's an electrochemical combination of hydrogen and oxygen that directly generates electricity, which we then convert to AC electricity, which is what everybody needs to drive their equipment uh, and then deliver that to the, the, the combustion. So fundamentally at the heart of the HPU is a electrochemical process in the fuel cell, combining hydrogen and oxygen to directly generate electricity. Back to you. Thanks, Ian. That's great. Um, next question, I'll, I'll take this one. So if HS2, given the huge scale of the program, how will HS2 reach net zero construction from 2035? So it is a challenge um, and it, it won't be easy to get there. But as I've set out in our net zero carbon plan, we do have a range of milestones and stepping stones on the journey to net zero. So eliminating diesel from construction sites and investing in the innovation like Geopura and hydrogen technologies and alternatives to diesel is a really key part of that. Beyond that, we also see that the decarbonisation of the production of concrete and steel being really key as well. And we're working with industry groups um, to decarbonise the production there as well. And I should also mention that in relation to diesel free, we've been working with Construct Zero to publish a route map for industry. So a lot of this, well, it can't be achieved individually by HS2. It's a collective endeavour and that's how we're setting ourselves up to partner with experts in the supply chain fields through collaboration, through investing in innovation and building the partnerships that are going to be really key in this collective endeavour to net zero. 
Um, some of the other key activities um, are about building capability within HS2. So we've recently been awarded um, Carbon Literate Organisation Silver Accreditation by the Carbon Literacy Project. Um, and as a, in, in doing that, we've had over 350 of our colleagues across HS2 certified as being carbon literate. And that's included members of our board and executive leadership team. So building capability, but then also partnering with experts and specialists within our sectors to drive and accelerate carbon reduction. OK, the next question. Um, one for you, Ian, again. Why can't you just use electricity from the mains grid instead of hydrogen? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, and I think there might have been a written response got into the, um, the Q&A bit on that already. The, um, the short answer is that the grid isn't always available um, at the locations where the power is required. Um, it's a construction site. Some of the uh, construction sites are in very rural areas um, and the grid simply isn't there. Or if it is there, it's not there in sufficient quantity. You know, there's not enough power available from the grid. Now, this is quite common in construction. You know, sort of by definition, you're in early before the, um, you know, the grid power is is often available um, and it's very uh, routine for uh, yeah, construction sites to use off grid power. So so on site generation for the power uh, to, to, to meet their power needs. What we're doing here that's different is using hydrogen and the HPU to provide that power. Uh, we're not getting that from a fossil fuel source which might otherwise have been used. Thank you. Back to you. Excellent. Thanks. Um, question here. What are the air quality benefits of using solutions like hydrogen technologies in construction? So I'll I'll just take this from a HS2 perspective and then um, pass over to Geopura for any additional thoughts. But construction is a, is a tough sector to decarbonise. So that's not only linked to the materials we use, but also how we build and the fuels that we use. And as, as you've seen, we set some ambitious objectives to eliminate diesel by 29. But there's no silver bullet and it's going to take a range of solutions to support different site challenges. Hydrogen does offer a promising solution to decarbonise plant and machinery and as Geopura have highlighted to replace the need for diesel generators, which unfortunately is still necessary in some areas and um, where we don't have mains power connections as you just heard. But by deploying these proven cleaner technologies, hydrogen, fuel cells, gas, etc, we're reducing emissions of harmful pollutants both on site, making sites safer places to work, but also reducing impacts on the surrounding communities and cleaning up local air quality. Um, Ian Omar from Geopura, do you have anything to add on the air quality benefits of solutions like Geopura? So, so, so I mean, as, as, you, as you've said, I mean, using hydrogen, um, the, be the benefits are 100 percent. There, there, there are no pollutants. The, uh, the only emission from our units is pure, pure water and quite small quantities of that. So um, I, I think that speaks for itself, really. Thanks, Matt. Um, so question here again, looks like for Ian. How do you produce your hydrogen? What energy sources are used to produce it and how efficient is it in terms of energy needed for production? production versus output? Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, I mean, the short answer is we use low carbon energy so electricity sources to reduce the hydrogen. That's really important um, to, you know, for us to produce low carbon hydrogen. That's the whole point. Um, the photo I showed you is actually at a biomass plant. Um, so we're directly taking um, electricity uh, for that electrolyzer in the photo there from a uh, from a biomass energy uh, energy plant um, and, and directly driving it from there. Um, other renewable energy sources are available, of course, um, and you can indeed get renewable energy over the grid if you need to. So um, uh, yeah, so low carbon electricity uh, sources to make the low carbon hydrogen. Um, the other question was around efficiency. I think um, electrolyzers are around 65 70% efficient uh, in producing the hydrogen. Um, so the uh, yeah, the, the, the electricity that goes in 60 to 70 percent of it comes out as stored energy in the hydrogen, which we use as a fuel. Um, I, we get the efficiency question quite a lot, actually. And the the, the important thing to realise with um, what we're doing here, that the it's the. The ability to deliver the energy when and where you need it makes the efficiency penalty, if you like, of going to hydrogen worthwhile. Um, it is more efficient just to take the electricity directly from the uh, the generation sources, you know, for example, over the grid. 
but as we were discussing earlier, the grid isn't um, isn't always there where you want it. And for that reason, then you need to be able to store and transport energy, and it then makes it worthwhile to suffer the efficiency heat of going to a, efficiency heat of going to a, a chemical fuel. Um, and of course, that is quite common. It's just the fuels we are used to using um, are hydrocarbon based fuels. And what we're doing here is using hydrogen to avoid the pollutants associated with um, hydrocarbon based fuels that Matt was just describing. So efficiency is a great question. It's an important consideration in what we're doing. But the um, the ability to store and transport the energy and deliver it when and where you need it makes the lower efficiency of hydrogen compared with direct consumption from a renewable source worthwhile. And hopefully that makes sense. Back to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Um, again, I think this is another question going back to you, Ian. How much water is produced as a byproduct and do you reuse that water at all? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, great, great question again. Uh, I mean, the, the without wishing to um, sound obstructive. The, the amount of water that's produced depends on how much power is being generated. You know, the rate at which we consume the hydrogen generate, you know, directly, you consume the hydrogen is combined with oxygen and that tells you how much uh, water that's generated. Our HPUs at full power uh, will generate around 50 kilos. So that's 50 litres of water an hour. As I mentioned before, the fuel cells run at 60, 70 degrees C. So about half that comes out as water vapour and is water vapour into the atmosphere. And the other half roughly um, is, you know, comes out as liquid, it condenses. Um, and then we just collect that in there. I think you saw it in the video, the, um, the, the, the drums there, and then they can be run into a drain. Um, the water is very pure. Um, I would describe it as deionized water, except that it was never ionized in the first place. If you, we use very pure hydrogen, run it through the fuel cell, combine it with the oxygen, uh, and then we get very pure water. So without any minerals in it uh, as well. And, and, and uses for that vary. Um, so, and, and often our customers get quite inventive with how they use that water. I mean, it's readily available. Um, people can use it for, for, for what they wish. As I say, it's very pure um, and it can be from everything from from wheel washing. We've, we've seen people filling up wash bottles in their cars uh, and other sort of more domestic uses for the water that's um, um, that's available. But it is very pure. Um, and uh, as I say, our customers sometimes get quite creative with, with, with how they use it. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. And yeah, we'll be returning to you again, Ian, with this question. How do you get around the exclusions zone for the hydrogen yeah well again the short answer is we don't um part of our site planning process is to look at the sites where we deploy um, and make sure that we have the appropriate separation distances uh, around the hydrogen storage and the hydrogen equipment that we need um hydrogen you know as a industrial compressed gas is nothing new the um the, all the, the the standards and guidance around using hydrogen safely uh, are very well established. It's been around for decades. As is the you know the, the the procedures you need to follow to use it safely. Um, the equipment is all very well established, and we we simply follow industry practice um, in in doing that. So it, it's it's not a case of getting around anything. It's a case of um, doing what we need to do to use it safely, and that's exactly what we do. Great, and then. Um... Now I've got a question here about HS2 and um, are we using, do we intend to use um, solutions like Geopura for the operational railway? Um, so our focus very much at the moment is on the construction stage where um, our activity is and eliminating diesel from our construction sites by 2029. So that's our first challenge. Um, but we do, our objective is to achieve net zero carbon emissions from all of our activities from 2035. So we do need um, zero emission solutions for the operational phase. The railway itself will be electrified. So that will um, run on zero carbon electricity from day one of operation. And we're working with our asset management, railway operations and um, infrastructure management teams to understand what our needs are and challenges are for net zero carbon operation through the operational phase. Um, so the, the aim will be to have alternative cleaner solutions in operation um, and a lot of the work that we're doing in the construction phase will set precedent and set practice that can be applied to the operational phase. OK, um, returning to you, Ian, there's a question here about what are the risks of a hydrogen leak creating an explosion and how are these mitigated? Yep, great question again. Um, 
so hydrogen is a flammable gas. Uh, so the risk associated with hydrogen is its flammability. Um, we, you know, we're using hydrogen here as a fuel. Fuels contain a lot of energy. That's why they're useful. Um, where it's just that hydrogen is perhaps less familiar uh, as a fuel, and therefore the hazards are less familiar than the hazards associated with hydrocarbon-based fuels, uh, which are, you know, often include um, flammable gases like, um, you know, propane, methane, um, butane, and so on. Um, so the yeah, it's a case of um, you know, as I was saying before, the the you know the risks associated with using hydrogen are well understood. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Was it just just give me the question, question again? Was um, to bear with me again, Rosie. Risk of explosion. Yeah, what are the risks of hydrogen leak? creating an explosion, oh, how are these mitigated? Yes, yeah, okay, great. So um, yeah, the risk associated with the leak is the flammability, uh, and we mitigate that by one of the first line of defense is to not have a leak, and we're very careful about um, the pipe work that we use. Um, uh, the, the, you know, we train people, everything's leak tested before we use it. Uh, again, this is all standard industry practice uh, to ensure that, you know, in the, in, in the first instance, the, you know, the hydrogen doesn't get out and, and and, and therefore you mitigate the risk of um, if you of having a leak. Um, there are, I should also point out, there are a number of safety systems in the uh, the hydrogen power unit that include hydrogen detectors. Um, so if there is a hydrogen leak, then there are hydrogen detectors there which initiate an emergency power off an EPO and shut down the system. So that's sort of that's another another line of defense. But there's there's lots of layers of protection, um, which again is is standard within the industry. The first being um, measures to prevent the leak happening in the first place and then uh, subsequent to that a number of layers of protection uh, to deal with that leak safely and avoid the uh, the hazard associated with the, the flammable hydrogen gas. Back to you Mark. Thank you. Um, so just as a reminder for getting to the last couple of questions here but reminder to the audience um, please do post any questions that you have. Um, so Ian, again, um, will the green hydrogen solution you currently operate meet large supply demands? And then as a second question, will a mix of blue hydrogen and green hydrogen production be considered to meet demand? Um, yeah, so firstly, so I understand the first question is, does this scale? And yes, yes. is the answer, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the more and larger fuel cell units that you have, you know, the more power you're able to you're more able to provide um, behind the scenes. That also then means you need to scale up your hydrogen production, and this, that's exactly what we're doing on the on the GeoPira side. We have um, a build-out program for HPUs to build more and more hydrogen power units, and then similarly a scale-up um, operation for our hydrogen production, uh, rolling out more um, electrolyzers at renewable energy sites in various locations across the the country to build out the um, the uh, uh, the hydrogen production side of things. So we've got fuel to operate those. So yes, absolutely, it scales. Um, and that's the really exciting bit about this is that it's it's a it's a viable proposition, um, you know, a viable alternative to fossil fuel here. Uh, and we're delighted to be able to demonstrate that here. And, and, and thank you again to HS2 for giving us the opportunity to uh, to show that this can be done in, in a real world scenario. Um, second question was around a mix of blue and green hydrogen. I mean, those terms are sort of in common usage, but are quite hard to pin down. Um, I think perhaps a, um, a, a a useful way to think about hydrogen is the you know the the carbon intensity of the you know that was the carbon intensity of the hydrogen that we use. Um, and I think the way the UK government going with this is to is to define the low carbon hydrogen standard. Um, I think that's quite a useful approach to take and and uh, you know absolutely it's important to us that the that low carbon hydrogen is used that's the whole point um if it meets that standard then then we would consider it appropriate for um for deployment on our uh, in our HPUs. Thank you Mark. Thanks Ian. Um, so then we have a, a final question I think for Matt this time how much does hydrogen cost compared to more conventional energy options? Yeah, really important question and goes back to, to, to what I opened up in saying that um, the solution isn't theoretical, it isn't for the future, it's for the now, it's real. 
um, and therefore it has to be cost comparative to other alternatives. Uh, so that's been our, our focus right from the outset. So we have a really transparent uh, costing model. Um, we price our hydrogen um, gas uh, at per litre DGE, diesel generator equivalent, which means for the same um, uh, you would pay for one litre of diesel, um, you can compare what you'd pay for one litre DGE, and that would give you the same energy, electricity, uh, electrical output that you'd get from that one litre of diesel fuel. Um, at the moment, the price differentiation is about 20% more for the hydrogen. So there is a, 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 a difference in price and we are slightly higher. But that said, uh, because of the way the system works, there are significant efficiencies over the hydrogen fuel cell over a diesel generator. Um, often you'll find in construction diesel generators are hugely over spec um, and they operate at their maximum efficiency at the power spec that they're, they're spec at. And often they use um, for much lower needs than they're spec at, which results in huge inefficiencies and, and um, overconsumption of diesel. But con conversely, the hydrogen fuel cell operates on almost the opposite basis. So um, you can't, in effect, over spec uh, a HPU. You'll get the same efficiency and linear efficiency of hydrogen use for the generation. So th in that respect, we can actually turn out quite a lot cheaper than using a diesel generator. And if you link the system to um, combined heat and power systems as well, then the efficiencies um, get really significant indeed. So that's how we price. Thank you, Matt. That's great. Um, so that wraps up all the questions that we have. So we'll just move on to thanking you all once again for taking the time to tune in today and for the questions. We've tried our best to answer as many as possible during the time available. If we didn't manage to answer your question today or if you have any of the questions about the wider HS2 programme, please contact our help desk. They're available all day, every day. We'd like your feedback on today's session, so please visit the link posted in, in the announcements or look out for an email from HS2 following this webinar. But then all that's left for me to say is thank you for joining us today and we hope you have a great day. Goodbye.